So this is me, Dr. Jonathan Cressy. I am a audio professor at Frederick Community College, uh, and I am also the owner of Fundamental Sounds. We are out of Little Rock, Arkansas. So I come up here once a month, usually to do sessions at Frederick, and then I teach their American popular music class online. Um, you can get at me at the Twitter and at my website and at my email. All of that stuff is there. Um, I And the QR code is if you want to visit my website. Let me just tell you right now, um, a call for what you want to learn, okay? I want to put stuff out on, you know, what my take on stuff is on the internet, but I need to have content. I need to know what people want, right, to learn. I'll, 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 I'll thread in the stuff that you don't want to learn, like, but I want to have, like, the main topics that you want to learn. And also for MAGFest, like, when I get called to come and do panels or to submit panels, I have to know what you all want to hear. Like, I'm, I am thrilled, by the way. Thank you all for coming at 11 o'clock on Sunday to this panel. I was sitting here going, man, what happens when no one shows up? Do I just, like, go over there and be like, hey, no one showed up? Or do I just give the panel, like, everybody's here? But, you know, like, thank you. Because this is something, like, I need to know what you want to learn and, like, what you want to hear about. Because, I mean, I could vamp on bit rate and sample debt, you know, all day and think it's so cool. And everybody else was like... Like, what are we doing, right? So, please, get in contact with me. Tell me what you like. Also, if you, if you enjoy this panel, please rate it on their guidebook because if it's rated, not rated, they don't know whether I did good or not. So this is called It Takes Two and then Three, maybe more, but what you need for a successful music production. So, these are my rules. These are things that I, I, I want this to be a discussion so y'all can talk and, and we're going to talk about this stuff. But this is sort of your basic how to get along with everybody and get what you're looking for. So over the past three years, I've moved out of being a full-time uh, academic into and a part-time engineer and professional trumpet player into a full-time engineer, producer, and mixing engineer, et cetera, a professional trumpet player, and a part-time academic. And, and I've noticed a lot of things, right? I've worked with a lot of artists, and I'm coming across the, th the same things over and over again. And I wanted to kind of show you or tell you about that so maybe you can think about it. All right, and this, this is going to come at both ends. At first, it was going to be like what artists can do because that's sort of one of those things. However, I think I'm also going to say as a producer and or I call in this, this, I call in this presentation the other, okay? Because it could be an engineer or it could be a producer or it could be whatever, right? I don't know how your musical production is working. Like for me, I tend to be the engineer and the producer, but sometimes I'm just the producer or sometimes I'm just the engineer, right? And so... We all have the same kind of skill set that we need. And so we're going to do both. So everybody has something to learn. And please don't get offended, all right? Because some, and you may be going like, well, duh. Let me just tell you, all of these things that I'm about to put up here have happened multiple times over and over again. And so they need to be said. All right. So the first one is, and I was going to be, I didn't know if this was a mag, uh, uh, what do you call it? A mag with the little kid one? I don't know, what is that called? The mag? Mag Scouts. I didn't know this is Mag Scouts, so I was going to use a different word than this. Okay? <laughs> don't be a jerk. That's the number one rule that I can give you ever, and I know it seems obvious, but please do not be a blank hole or a jerk. Okay? Don't. Because it doesn't matter how good you are. See, that's one of the biggest misnomers out there. Everybody says, well, if you're great, everybody's going to want to work with you. No. That is not true. They'll be like, wow, let's hire him or her. And they get in the studio and then they're like, wow, let's never hire him or her again because they would rather work with somebody nice. Okay, and this is something I tell my students. I can give you the knowledge to get in the room, but it's your job to stay in the room. And that was the big thing as like an intern. I would get in the room by having the knowledge to be there, but if I opened my mouth or said something stupid, I could very, very easily be out of the room, right? So don't be a jerk. Now, what do I mean by don't be a jerk, okay? We all like to think that we know everything and that we know better than others. And maybe you do, right? You may know more than I do, right? 
But you don't want to come off as the person who knows everything. You don't want to come off. And if you're an artist, don't be a jerk. I know you're paying for that producer or you're paying for that, art, that mixing engineer to come and work with you, right? But if you're a jerk and you're unwilling to listen to reason or to listen to other ideas, that can be a real problem. Right, because what will happen is, well, no one will work with you. Like for instance, I'll give you two examples from art as an engineer to an artist. So I was working with a band, all the bands will remain nameless. And it came to the day where we were about to have a session, right? And this was a session that I was giving at Frederick Community College. So I had all my students come in and we were all gonna get together and, and, and record this band. And the and two things the 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 first band, they called and said, oh yeah, uh, you know, we're not gonna come. And this was literally three hours before the session was gonna start, okay? So they had better things to do, they didn't respect what we were doing because we were a school. And so I said, okay, that's cool, no problem, we'll figure it out, whatever. And that was the last time that band has ever been called to a studio in the entire county because once people found out that they were willing to waste my time, they then said, hey, well, I've got paying clients. I'm not going to get waste. No, they're not going to waste my time. So that's one thing. Another time we had a percussionist who decided to get really mad and throw his percussion equipment all because he didn't bring spikes for his bass drum. And so every time he hit the bass drum, it scooted forward on the floor. And, you know, it was, I loved the band and I loved the music that they made. Will I ever ask to work with that person? And they have asked, hey, do you want to do a thing? No, I do not. Thank you. Right? So don't be a jerk. As a producer, okay, as a producer and engineer, you hold the artist's ideas in your hands. And when you start turning the artist's ideas into your ideas and you start treating that artist poorly, you can affect the way that artist works with any other producer that they see. I have a, a client who was literally terrified to get in front of the microphone because of how a producer treated them at their last session. Like it took me a long time to just get them to show up because they were so scared, right? So don't be a jerk, it's not worth it, all right? Any comments about anybody worked with a jerk? No, every, wow, you guys are lucky. I work with them all the time. Maybe it's me, I don't know. Okay, communicate. Please don't do this, where everybody sits in the control room on their phones, not communicating. And what do I mean by communicating? So here's a cool story. So I was working with a band, and I'll, I'll just come out and tell you with the band, because they're signed under my label, The Hex Girlfriends, and we released a single called uh, Circle of Stones. And the first time we went to record it, I listened to their demo. And we were listening to in the studio the demo and I heard um, a shower was recorded, right? It was a shower and, and I thought, oh, they're trying to simulate rain because it's like Circle of Stones. I figure it was like, right? It's going to show rain. And so I was like, wow, that's cool. You guys are trying to simulate rain. And the artists were like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what we were doing. And so as, as production went on and we got close to the end, I went out and recorded real rain. So I went out and with my Foley equipment and my umbrella and we recorded rain and I put it in and we started mixing. We got all the way to the mastering stage when one of the artists said, hey, whatever happened to the shower? And I was like, what, that wasn't supposed to be rain? And she was like, oh no, it was supposed to be a shower. And I was like, what, what? I thought we had a discussion about this being rain. And like, no, it's supposed to be a shower. And I was like, okay. And so then I went into my shower and I recorded a shower and put that in. But it was one of those things, like we spent literal years working on this, like a year and a half. And never once did anybody tell me at any of those points, it was there, like that rain was always there, that it was supposed to be a shower, right? And they, I guess, when I said, hey, is this supposed to be rain? They almost, they like adopted that and said, oh yeah, that's what it's supposed to be, when they really should have been like, no, no, it's supposed to be a shower. And I would have been like, oh, okay, it's supposed to be a shower, right? So communicate, make sure as an artist, you are communicating with your, um, with your producer so they understand what you are going for. 
as a producer, make sure you are listening and you are communicating and you are, you are constantly understanding. Like, that's one of the things that I started saying. So I'll say something like, so am I, t like, this is what I heard. And then you tell them what you heard. You go, am I understanding this correctly? And they'll be like, okay, yes or no. And then I'll say, now, be honest, think about it. Am I saying this correctly? What's going on? Because you really want people to understand what's, what's working. And then finally, these are sort of like the, the whole things. Start with the end in mind. And yes, I stole this from like, I don't know, Thomas Covey or something. I don't know, some like self-help guru. Start with the end in mind. Always try to figure out where you're going to go. Uh, there's been a lot of this mythos behind or aesthetic behind, oh, the Beatles just went in and figured it out, and the Rolling Stones just went in and figured it out, okay? And that probably is true to some extent. But in modern, you know, unless you are the Rolling Stones and you can hire out a studio where you can just sit there and pluck on your guitar for however long to figure it out, you really have to know where you're going to end up first. And this is important because this is another thing that artists don't think about a lot is you have to remember, like, do you want to be famous? Like, there was a panel in here um, about content creation and Twitch. Did anybody, was anybody at that panel? Right. And what was one of the things that, what was the thing that, that, that was, that people didn't like that one of the persons said? Do you remember? Oh, it's probably not going to happen. Well, not just that it's probably not going to happen, but it was, it was what that guy said, though. He said that you had to look at the metrics. And if you liked to play a certain game, but everybody else wanted you to go back to play the old game, you had to go back and play the old game, right? I forget what game it was. I guess it was, uh, I don't know, do you remember? Was the Binding of Isaac guy. Yeah, the Binding the Isaac guy. He's like been playing Binding of Isaac for like 8,000 hours, and he's like, I just want to play another game. But everybody wanted to watch him play Binding of Isaac. And so that's something. Like, if you want to be famous, like if you want to be the next Adele or Taylor Swift, besides having talent and all that, you're going to have to give people what they want, right? And artistically, you have to figure out how you can be artistically uh, fulfilled by doing that. That's a really tough thing, and I, I hate to have to say it, but like I've got to, I've got to get it through people's heads. Now, if you don't want to be famous and you don't care and you just want to make stuff, then go ahead and make stuff and do what you want, right? And then maybe you will make something that happens to align with a trend that is happening and you might go viral and it might be great. But that's kind of like how a one-hit wonder works, right? They have that one song that strikes a chord in a youth, in, the, in, in whoever they're aiming at, and it goes that, and it, go, and it takes off, but then nothing else takes off, and it's because they didn't follow it up. But if you look at someone like, like Taylor Swift or Adele, I use them a lot in my examples, she writes, they write music about things that everybody can care about, right? Heartbreak, stalking, whatever, right? They all know about it, they all, and, and people eat it up because that's what they do, right? So, and that's calculated. It's not not calculated. That wasn't something that someone said, hey, I'm just going to write what's in my heart and it's going to be what everybody wants to hear. No, there was a calculation to it. That's sort of the hard thing. So know where you want to go because that informs the producer and the recording engineer and all of these people on how they're going to record your stuff. That's the important stuff right there. Okay? And, and okay, so... Let's talk about, we'll do the artist last. Let's talk about the other, okay? And I put up here as the other, it's like the producer or the engineer or both or whatever because ev everything is mishmashed. Back in the old days, you had a tracking engineer and then you had a mixing engineer and then you had a mastering engineer and then you had a producer and they were four separate people. <laughs> and nowadays, you kind of have a tracking, like they're all the same. Or maybe you've got two people or maybe you've got three or whatever, right? As the other, when you listen and you find out what the artist's influences are or where the artist wants to go, you have to do your research, okay? You're not allowed in this climate to have a sound. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand what a sound is? 
I'll give you an example just in case, because I know it's early. Andrew Sheps, fantastic guy. He's got a beard. Got a low, right? He has a sound. All of his music has a sound. When you listen to it, he did uh, some songs for a Zach Brown band CD. And in fact, he did the whole CD. And my wife loves the Zach Brown band. She's a big country music star uh, fan. Don't hold it against her. And we were listening to it on the way to Shenandoah when I was living up in this area and we were going to go hiking. And I, like, we listened to a song and I turned her and I was like, Andrew Sheps mixed that song. And she goes, there's no way you could figure that out. And I'm like, no, look on the credits. I bet you that he did it. And she looked on the credits and found out that, yes, he had mixed that song. And I found out later doing research that he had mixed the entire CD. I don't know what that CD was in particular. But they actually got rid of most of his mixes because it was so far away from what the band's image was that only one survived. And they ended up having to get the whole album remixed. Okay, so having a sound is not something that you necessarily can have nowadays as an engineer. You've got to be a chameleon. You've got to be able to give people what they want so you can, you can boost your career and do what you love, which is, I hope, making music, right? So this is what I profess. When you learn how to do stuff, right, you need and you learn sort of the fundamentals. Do your research. So I, I did an album for a band called Dumb Valley, and it's, it, the album's called Dumb Valley. And when they came to me, I said, what are, your, what are your influences? And he said, Din Lizzy, that's my influence. We, we love 70s hard rock music. And I went, okay, all right, I can dig that. Right, and so I went and I listened to the entire discography. I listened to everything that I could get my hands on that was 70s rock music. And then when we started production and tracking, I made sure that all of the stuff that we were doing was in line with the aesthetic that, that, that the artist, Dumb Valley, wanted for the album. Right? Because I could sit there and I could listen. Hey, man, you know, Truck Amendment sounds a whole lot like... And I would sound out the next, the next tune that was like a Thin Lizzy tune right, or whatever, and, and he's like, yeah, it does, and he was amazed that I had taken the time to listen to the entire discography, right, we can do that now, like, get on Spotify and listen to the whole damn thing, just everything, and take notes, like, you be an academic when it comes to this, L figure out what things sound like, another really good uh, version of this would be Crystal Spheres by, um, that we just released, okay, we were going back and forth, it's trumpet ensemble. It sounds, it's really hard to deal with, right? Because it's trumpet ensemble. And there was a, and, but I asked the, the, the director, I said, like, what do you imagine this as being? And he, and he, you know what he said? He said, Tonight Show Band. So what did I do? I was like, okay, The Tonight Show, Los Angeles, uh, Capitol Records, in the 80s, Doc Severinsen, okay, go. And then I went and I found out what Capitol Records was doing with their reverb and their sound in the 80s with Doc Severinsen. You know, they're using uh, an EMT 140 plate and they're using Lexicon 480s. And so I went to UAD and I got those plugins and I dumped them on the thing, found some stuff, and immediately we found what he was listening, looking for. It was just like this. And we had, been spent, we had spent months trying to figure it out. Right? But it wasn't until he was able to pinpoint his influence and I was able to go out and find out what he was actually listening for. Because it could be anything, right? It could be maybe he wants it to sound, you know, like maybe the rock band wants to sound like uh, Iggy Pop and the Stooges. Well, that's completely different than seven, like it's still in the 70s and it's still rock music, but it isn't 70s rock music, right? It's punk music and it's totally different. So if he said, if, you know, if Dumb Valley had said, hey, we want it to be Iggy Pop, then I would have gone and gotten raw power and listened to that and gone, okay, how do I make this not sound total like garbage like this, but close, right? If anybody's listened to raw power, it's garbage as far as the recording goes. It's, but it's, you know, it's like the music is so good, you're like, okay, whatever, it's fine. Like, I feel bad for David Bowie because he was basically handed a two track that's like, here, mix this. And he's like, mix what? It's already mixed. What am I supposed to do, right? So anyway, do your research. Listen to stuff. I am not a fan of records. I'm not someone who collects records, OK? 
okay? However, I do have a collection of records because I have found that as things are getting mastered in the digital age, they're changing, right? If you ever want to see something change, get Led Zeppelin and their, and their catalog and how it has gotten remastered. It was remastered in the, uh, the 90s and then like 2001 and then 2007 and now I think, two, I think they ended like a couple years ago. And each time they've changed the way their tune sounds. So if you really want to know what it sounded like in the 60s, you got to go back and listen to the record or the original CD pressing for you to understand what it sounded like. And that's what I mean by research. Do it, it's, it's a whole lot easier now than it was when I started. But then you can start, then go on Gearspace, find pictures of, of, your, of your band and where, how they were being recorded and, and try to figure out what they were doing. And you'll be surprised how close that can get you to where you're going. Now, the last thing that you can be is you need to listen and you need to be kind as the other, okay? So you, uh, the way I, tr I approach uh, producing is how I approach uh, teaching privately, teaching trumpet privately. So I used, to, I used to be a private instructor, taught trumpet, and you always had to treat each person the way they needed to be treated in order for them to learn. And as a producer, that's what you're doing. You have, this artist has given you access to them, and you have to respect that. You can't just tear someone apart. Right? You have to be supportive in whatever manner in which they need to be supported in order to make them feel comfortable so you can get the best out of them. Right? Sometimes you need to tell someone, like if you're working with a, a, a pop vocalist, they tend to need to be coddled. They need to be like, hey, you're doing great. It's fine. Let's do this. You know, it's great. Right? And you have to be very careful about it, diminishing returns. As soon as like, you go two takes with not getting something good, you're like, okay, let's move on because you know you've, you've tapped out your vocalist. If you are a classical engineer, you will know that you cannot speak to your artist and you can't say, hey, you know that's out of tune because they'd be like, yes, I know it's out of tune. Right, and they'll get very angry at you and it's like, you can't say like, well, I think maybe we should break on. No, we will keep going until I get it right. You know, it's like they are very driven and they have a different way of thinking about things. Right, so you have to know your audience of your artist, listen to them, and make sure you're being kind in whatever way they need, okay? Any questions about what a producer needs to do? Like the big thing is that research component. You have to know what sound you're going for before you start. Stop thinking, oh, I'll be able to just use whatever I want and then I can make it sound later, sound like what I want later in the mix. Because you might be able to, right? But odds are, it's gonna be really hard. So if you start from the beginning getting the sounds that match what they're going for, then it makes the mixing process simple. It's just easy at that point because you've already done it. You've basically mixed while you were tracking. Now, the artist. Now, the artist has some things on their plate too. Okay? And the biggest thing is you have to practice. How many here are artists? All right. How many here? So you all play instruments. What, what instruments do we have? Drums. Trumpet and trombone. Excellent. All of these things. How many here are classically trained? All right. So the classically trained people kind of already understand this. Well, at least they used to. When I was a kid, they used to. I don't know now. Right? But like we were, like I used to practice so much as a trumpet player that my teacher had to take my mouthpiece once. He was like, look, man, you're hurting yourself. You need to stop. You get to go, you can't do it anymore. Hand me your mouthpiece. It was like, it was like having your, in, in the army, having your like stripes ripped off your shirt, right? So, so you have to practice. If you are a pop artist, a vocalist in particular, I find this a lot with vocalists, you have to know your tune. I cannot tell you how many times I've gone into a session and the vocalist didn't even know the words to the song they wrote. That just like blew my mind. And so here's the thing. If you're an artist, you need to practice your tune every day. You need to sing it 
all the way through or play it all the way through every day. You need to be able to do it whether you have a band next to you or not, okay? I have very little, and this is, I'm, I'm gonna get intense here for a second. Uh, I'm a trumpet player, and if I wanna practice the Haydn Trumpet Concerto, I can't, I can't hire an orchestra to practice it. So I have to sit in a room, like a, a, a what, five by five cube, with the door shut, practicing the Haydn Trumpet Concerto as if there's an orchestra behind me, right? And I can hear that orchestra while I'm playing. And that's something as a vocalist, as a drummer, as a guitarist, you need to be able to sit down with your tune, right? Like uh, Knights of the Round, I watched them, right? Their guitarist should, I don't know if he does or not, but he should be able to sit there and think to himself, okay, this Final Fantasy soon and just be like, dun, 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 and like be able to do it without a drummer, without the bassist, without anybody, and just be able to hear everything behind him. And the way you get to there is you practice over and over and over again, right? You become so familiar with the tune that if I'm like, okay, uh, go to verse two, go, and you can sing it on pitch and, and sing it. Now, you might not be able to do it on pitch, but you will get there. You will know where it is. You won't go, I wonder, I know I need to start four measures before that so I know where I am. You should know where you are. The reason being is because the studio is not the time to practice, right? Because you're paying for that time. And two, it's very frustrating as an engineer because it then starts, you start to think, well, maybe you don't respect my time, right? Which is always bad. Again, that's like, don't, don't be a jerk. And two, whenever we're trying, you know, like we're in production now, we're getting ready to release something. We want to, you want to, I want to know that you know what you want. And the only way you can know what you want is by practicing it. Because what you do is you practice, you record yourself, you listen to it and go, oh, that's bad. But then you can say, hey, I'm going to do this different and in verse two. Or I'm going to do this different in the chorus. Or I'm going to do this, this different during my solo or whatever. And you can learn it and do it. Now, when you practice, that's the, big, that's the proficiency part, like being proficient being so familiar with your music that you can just be like, okay, let's go, and just do it. All right, has any of you, have any of you ever gone on YouTube and watched like Frank Sinatra sing live? Okay, like his, like, or if he's on TV. And I, watch, I watched a thing where he's on TV, he strolls out on stage and just starts singing, and he's perfectly in tune, perfectly in time, you know, and it's like nothing. And you would immediately think, oh, he must be lip syncing, but they didn't do that back then. He's singing live. And if he coughs, he just hops right back on. Like, it was like he just left that word out and went right back in, starting in, like he didn't get flustered. And then we have the, 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 the uh, artists, the more modern artists, who like go on Saturday Night Live and the band starts playing the wrong song and they don't even know what the words are. Ashley Simpson. That, the scariest part of the Ashley Simpson episode wasn't that she was lip syncing. It was that she didn't know what song they were playing. So the band had four bars. She should have been like, oh, we're on that song again, and then sing those words. But she didn't. She had no idea what song it was. That's what scares me, because she wrote that song, supposedly. So you'd think she would know. So you've got to be proficient. Now, when you practice, the two big things that are important in a studio in a studio setting, in terms of importance, are time. Being in time is a hundred percent the most important thing in a studio setting. Okay. So knowing how to play with a click track, knowing how to uh, play. So a click track is a metronome for those of you who don't use metronomes you know, play with a click track, be comfortable with having that on. Because in a modern, you know, in a modern uh, uh, production, we're gonna be doing things separately. Or we may be doing everything together, but we may need to edit later on, and having everything in time is super helpful, right? And so having, being able to deal with a click track and have that in your headphones is super, super important. So practice with a metronome. You can play within the beat. And if you get comfortable with a metronome, you know, you have the first beat and the second beat, and then there's this entire space in the middle that you get to play around with, right? And it's so much fun. 
but you got to get comfortable with that. Intonation's not that big of a deal. It's important. You really don't want to be super bad at it, but we do have tools that can fix it. Like Melodyne can make pretty much anything sound okay, but you really want to try to be in, like, in tune as the best you can. But again, practice, right? Practice is so, so, so important. Familiarity, intonation, and time. Now notice how I didn't say getting the notes right, because we can always get the notes right later. Yes? <laughs> right, that is actually a great point. So we bring up the, the point that, that missing too many notes makes post-production awful, and it's also money. So you are correct. You're absolutely correct. And, and so, again, that comes with practice. Practice your part. Doing it in the, doing it in the session is not okay. Right? Because again, the more you practice, the more you know what the end is. You have an idea of what you're going for, and then we can all, then we can work with it. Right? Then if you get a producer, they can come up with an idea or an angle, and you can shift because you're so proficient at what you're doing that you, and, and the song, that you can change on the fly. But if you don't know what you're doing from the beginning, like I had an artist come in and say, uh, the first time she came in, she goes, should I have been practicing this? And I went, y you haven't? What do you mean you haven't practiced this? Well, I, I, I just, I mean, like, I, I wrote the words down. And I'm like, uh, okay. And so that didn't go well. And so then the next time, she said, oh, I practiced this time. But it turned out that she had practiced the day before for, like, six hours. So then she got to the session and couldn't sing. And it's like, no, no, no. Every day, five minutes, man, just five minutes. That's all we need, five minutes. Sing through the song. Hit some spots. Go about your business. Do it again. Like, do it three times a day. Know your stuff. The next big thing as an artist, know your influences. Again, this all comes by knowing, knowing, what, uh, knowing the end, where you want to go. Know what your influences are. Okay? When someone asks, because when the, when the, the producer should ask, a good producer will come in or a good engineer will be like, okay, we're going to do this stuff. Um, and you've sent them a demo. And they should have listened to that demo and then started writing down things that it sounded like. That's one of the big things that I do. Like I'll bring in someone at Frederick and I'll have them send a demo in. And then I get all the students together and we sit and we listen to the demo. And I'm like, okay, who does this sound like? And we start, li we start listing artists and we start listing songs that it sounds like. Because everybody's got influences. That's just the way it is now, right? But that brings me closer to the end product that we're trying to get at. Like the young lady who I was working with uh, who didn't practice, she sounded like, uh, now I can't remember the lady's name. What's the artist that brother writes the music? Billie Eilish. Billie Eilish, Yes. And so she sounded like that. And I hadn't really listened to a lot of that music. So I had to go and I had to listen to the discography, understand how the, the vocals were treated, understand how the different aspects of the tune were treated so that we could get closer to that when, uh, when we were recording. And, but I have, there's tons of times when I walk in and I say, hey, to the artist, all right, so what are your influencers? Like, I don't know. Like, well, what do you listen to? Uh, stuff. Well, can you give me anything? Well, I, how about this? And they'll shoot out a tune. And you're like, you listen to it, and you're like, okay, but that doesn't sound anything like this song. And they're like, oh, well, no, that's just something I like. I, I don't know, like, I didn't know that you meant, like, what this song, I don't know what influenced me to make this song. You have to know. Because in order to communicate back to the, the engineer, you have got to understand where you came from. Does that, make, does, does that make sense to people? Like you have to have an understanding of where you are as an artist so that the engineer can most quickly get there. 
right? Also, uh, yes, go ahead. I'm curious if you've had a method of success with getting artists to understand their influences as the engineer of three four in a situation where they don't often. Right. My, the best, the, again, the, the best one that I had so far was the hard rock band Dumb Valley. Walked in and immediately said, this is what I listen to, and I love this. And I, and I was like, okay. And when I made, like, it was so, let me give you the example of, when they came in and told me that, and, and we listened to their demo, and then I went and did my research and came back, and then we recorded the album, we actually, I actually gave him, you know, a bounced file of the album, or of, of the tunes, right? With all of the faders at zero. So nothing had been mixed, there had been no reverb, nothing. And he listened to it and was like, this is the best thing ever. It's done, right? And I'm like, it's not done yet, we didn't even mix it. But because we worked so hard in the tracking phase and we knew what he was going for, it was almost like it mixed itself. I mean, we were done in like a week. It was that quick. And then on the other side, having that artist come in and say, well, I don't know who I sound like, or yes, this song sounds like Billie Eilish, but I don't really want to be like Billie Eilish. Well, you wrote a song like Billie Eilish. What do we do? So how do I work with that? That is about, okay, let's sit down and let's, let's start, let's, what do you listen, let's bring up your playlist. What do you do? And we bring up their Spotify or their Apple Music or whatever, and we start listening to their stuff together. And this is just more time. I mean, this is what, as a producer, you have to invest this kind of time with people. And um, I usually do this over um, outside of the session, and I'm doing it over listen to or one of these remote work things where they're playing Spotify through their computer, and I'm listening to their Spotify, and they can start telling me, you know, what they like. Like, what do they like about this song? Well, I really like the guitar licks in this song, and I really like the bass lines in this song, and I really like this, and you start to put the pieces together that way. That's as close as I've been able to do it. Yes? Have you ever had experience where you had an artist that uh, said that their influences in a whole body of different sounds that you've had to you know, somehow figure out how to find together, that they thought they were combined together and just somehow to see that vision through? Yes, I have. And that, that uh, like the Hex Girlfriends were, are like that. They have a huge list of people that they're influenced by. And then sometimes their music doesn't match those influences very well, but I find pieces of the influences. And what I've relied on that is I've sat down and said, okay, this song sounds like to me like this. Like for instance, they're, they're gonna release a song called Unbroken. And the minute I heard this song, I was like, wow, this sounds like a Donna, Donna Summers tune. Like immediately, it was like a disco Donna Summers tune. And the hex girlfriend said, well, no, it's not disco, right? And, and so I was like, okay, it's not disco. Well, and then I said, well, you know what? How about you go and perform it a couple times, right? Go put it on your concert schedule, perform it a bunch of times, and then we'll come back. And you tell me what it is. And when they came back, they were like, it's a disco tune. <laughs> Like, but they hadn't even performed it yet. It was a song that they wrote and practiced together as a band, but they hadn't actually been on stage yet with it. And that's the other thing is artists. If you're going to be a performing artist, I highly, highly recommend you get on stage before you go in the studio. Because all sorts of stuff gets worked out on the stage, like classical especially. Like if you are a classical artist who has a small ensemble, man, get on stage and play. You know, go to your churches and give concerts and do all of the things that you do. And all of a sudden, all of those things will start to work themselves out. And then when you get to the session, now it's really ready because it, it, it's already been tried by fire, if that, may, if that makes sense. And that's a little different than, what I, than other people have recommended because of what typically happens is um, artists go on tour after they've written their album right? Because the tour is the promotion for the album. But you've got to treat it like, um, I think it's Dave Chappelle. So Dave Chappelle, apparently, and I could be wrong about this, but I'm just going to go with it because I think this is what's in my head, is that he would rent out an entire comedy club for a month. And he would go in and he would start doing jokes. 
and they would bomb. And he would start weeding out the jokes that bombed and bring in the jokes that didn't bomb. And then eventually, by the end of that month, he had 40 minutes of solid gold, right? So he was basically trying, he was honing his craft on stage so that when he went on tour, everything was fantastic. And, and that's kind of where I feel artists need to be. Like, go to an open mic night or whatever and perform and work it out. Yes? Uh, do you think that like, gauging like, audience participation, especially with like, live music, is also a helpful way? Because like, you mentioned genre and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. People are going to be participating with disco differently than they're going to be like tango. Right? Yes. So. No, you're absolutely right. So he's saying audience partic participation. Well, let me tell you this. OK, here's another great story. So here I'm representing Dumb Valley at the time, and I go to one of their shows. And they were on with another band called the Fun Boys, and they were playing their music, right? And, and everybody in the, the, the place, they were like, yeah, this is cool, and they were into it, right? And then at the end, they both decided, the both bands got together and decided to do covers of tunes. And I have never seen, well... That was my first experience watching an entire room explode. Like, they were like, yeah, your music is great, but the covers that you're doing are awesome. And like, they just, the whole room just, just screamed and was ecstatic. And of course, I go straight to the band. I'm like, hey man, we need to do covers. And they were like, no, we don't do covers. I'm like, okay but did you just see what I saw? Because, like, they like your stuff, but they really like it when you do other people's stuff. <laughs> and I'm not saying, like, we don't have to, like, you know, do only covers, but what if we just did one? Like, just, like, one really cool one. That would be great, just because people loved it. So, yeah, the, judging the reaction of the people on stage or on, in the audience, how much they love it, right? I mean, I do the same thing when I'm giving you guys lectures. Like, I'm looking at you, and if you're falling asleep, I'd be like, okay, I got to figure out something better to talk about or be more exciting. It's like the voiceover lecture when I brought someone on stage and they did uh, uh, Lord of the Rings expert, uh, excerpt from the Lord of the Rings in the voice of Mario as played by Chris Pratt. <laughs> and at that point, Everybody was happy, and it was fantastic, right? And that was, what, that was what did it. So, yeah, you definitely have to judge your crowd. And that's, again, a benefit of going out and doing stuff. You don't have to tour, right? But just getting out and playing your music and working out all the kinks and seeing what makes things better and what makes people more excited. You know, it's like, is that, you know, is that seven-minute seven solo in the minute of this jazz tune really that great or should we cut it down or maybe they really dig it and you want they want more i don't know you know it's it's those kind of things that you want to to to, to look at i i even imagine like you know like video game music right how many of y'all play the video game covers couple all right excellent right so video game covers i can only imagine like that that happened like they discovered that it would be cool when some person just decided to do a cover in the middle of one of their sets somewhere like somebody like like i'm i know that i know that there were like video game bands like the one ups and 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 what mini bosses and stuff like that but i'm sure at some point somebody decided to do an arrangement of the mario tune in the middle of one of their sets and somebody went oh this is a thing i didn't know it would be a thing but it is a thing and then it catapults people off in that way Right. So he's saying that when so you're you're a jazz musician, right? And and he's talking about soloing and he's saying mixing fours, which you know, you're trading back and forth four measures of a solo, and he said that people go crazy when you mix in video game music into that. Which is totally makes sense because that's what jazz musicians have always done. They take the music of the time and they add it into things. Like, you know, if you look at 50s soul music, right? And you look at um, Ray Charles and I've Got a Woman. I mean, that is I've Got a Savior. It is a Baptist hymn. It's I've Got a Savior way over Jordan. And he just changed the words to I've Got a Woman 
uh, what is it, across town or something like that. He just changed the words, but it's literally a church tune. And the reason he did that was because everybody in his audience went to church and knew the tune. So immediate, immediate familiarity, and then he just changed the words to make it his own and to make it a pop song. And that goes all the way back to medieval Europe, where you had people who were writing music for the church, and they were stealing melodies from the pop bands of the time, and they were putting it in their hy hymns and in their glorias and stuff. Like, and, and it was to make, because then the people who came to church would know the tune and they'd be like, hey, we'll sing along or whatever. And then it happened the other way too, where the bands were stealing from the, the church musicians. So it's just interesting how you can do that. Any other questions? No, really? We got 10 minutes, yes. Okay, so he asked, as an artist, what are my own influences? So as a trumpet player, uh, believe it or not, my influences were, well, my biggest influence was Harry James. So Harry James was my favorite trumpet player and I had no idea who he was. Um, ironically, I can't play jazz at all. Um, I, 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 put, I take that back. I can, I'm a really good third trumpet player. Like I can play that third trumpet part like nobody's business and I can really, like if I hear something, I can play it back. But don't ask me to read a jazz chart, can't do it. And uh, I can't improv. Like the big joke was that it was Jonathan's, uh, what do they call it, uh, when I was in college. It was like my, uh, I don't know, it was just not good, <laughs> it was bad. Um, but yeah, Harry James was a big influence to me as a trumpet player, uh, specifically his work with Benny Goodman. And then uh, from there, really my classical stuff is more, you know, Hawk and Hardenberger and some other people, not that that matters. But then my pop influences are mainly hard rock, uh, a little heavy metal, Although I'm not, like I was super into heavy metal when I was a kid, but then I got a little too sad and so I had to go to something more like, like hard rock. Um, classical musicians tend to really dig heavy metal music because of the complexity of it. It's very symphonic and so we dig it, but it also tends to be like uber sad. Um, and so you gotta be careful with that. I, I get a little too sad with heavy metal. So I, I, I moved on to things like ACDC and uh, those type bands or like Happy Cure, which is not hard rock at all, but like the Happy Cure, which is like the later stuff uh, and things like that. But I'm, I'm more into that, that hard rock, heavy metal thing, and then also the classical and, and jazz. Those are my influences. Um, as far as modern bands go, I always dig the bands that are, that have like a, that have a more, happy-go-lucky, doesn't have to be happy, but like a more like devil may care kind of, of music. So like, uh, I'm trying to think of the some of the names of the bands, or like ska music, that's huge. That was huge back when I was, I was a kid. You know, all of those. So yeah, those are my, my influences, and that one I hear. Yes? Oh, okay. So you're the artist. And so she asked, what's the advice for the artist who is their own producer, right? Okay, my first, my first thing to say is find a producer, okay? But the only reason I say that is, and it's not because of anybody's ability, you have to have at least one other person in the room. Maybe not at the same time, but someone to bounce ideas off of because when you're the talent and the producer at the same time, uh, the roles get mixed up, right? Like you don't like, cause you're so stuck in on it, right? You're like, this is mine. You have so much invested in it that if someone's like, whoa, 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 maybe like, like, has anybody seen House of a Thousand Corpses? Okay, this is, this is, this is the thing. So Rob Zombie made a movie called House of a Thousand Corpses, okay? Now, I don't know if it's become sort of a cult classic, but at the time when it came out, I was in, I was in master's school and it's the only movie I have ever walked out of and I found out that I can get a refund because it was so bad. And the joke was in the industry was like, no one was there going, hey, hey Rob, um, I think we need to rethink this because it's like really bad. 
it's not very good. But he was so stuck in on it, right? So what, so what I would say as, as a person who does their own stuff, number one, always start, again, start with the end in mind. All right? Know where you're going with it. And then as you do it, as you start working with it, every time you get to a new phase, take a break. So when I mix something, one of my best, the, one of the best tips I have for people who mix is once you've gotten to the end of the day and you're done mixing, you leave everything the same, however you've got it, right? You leave everything on. You shut your door and you go to sleep or you go do whatever. The first thing you do when you walk in the next day is you walk in, you sit down, and you hit the space bar. And you listen to it. And if you go, oh my God, what was I thinking? Then you can take, take stock of everything that was wrong and go back and fix it and do it again. But that space that you give yourself is huge because you come in with like a fresh perspective. And so I do actually do some of this. So like I will mix, produce, and master for my artists. And I have to build into the time schedule when we release. I build in a month where I do not work on their music. So there's a month, there's 30 days where I don't work on their music. I work on other people's music. And then I come back and I'm going to master and I hit that play. And I go, okay, now I know where I am and, and I go into it. If I have found that if I just push all the way through, the end product is worse because there's things I didn't catch. Um, the other thing to know, and this is for everybody, how do you know when you're done? That's a big thing for people who, that's again, why you have a producer, because producers go, it's done. It's the Christine Aguilera story where she's doing Genie in a Bottle, and she's laying on her back, and she sings the, 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 uh, the vocal for it, and it's a, it's a scratch vocal. So she's on the floor in the dark singing with, I don't know, holding the microphone or doing whatever, and the producer's just like, yeah, that's it. We don't need to do that again. And she, all the way up until even after the release of the album, was crying that it needed to come back and they needed to redo the vocals because it wasn't good enough. And the producer was like, no, it's done. I'm sorry, it's over and done. So you don't have that. So how do you know when it's done? You know it's done that when you listen to it, there isn't anything wrong. Like nothing sticks out. It's the stick out principle. If it sticks out, then, like, technically, if something sticks out, it's not right, and it, will sa it won't translate. That's the big, that's the industry term. How do you get it to translate? Well, if something sticks out, it won't translate. Does that make sense? You might be listening to it and think and go, oh, I hear the bass. That means the bass is sticking out. Now, it may be pleasant on your sound system. But because that bass is sticking out, when you put it on this sound system, it's going to sound like garbage. Because this sound system's got too much bass. And it's going to make that thing just explode out. So what you want is you want to listen to it and go, okay, all right. You know, it might not be the greatest thing in the world, but nothing sticks out. Then it's done. If nothing sticks out, it's done. The other thing is to, when you set that end in mind, what do you want? Like, what's your time? Like, set, you know, how long the tune's going to be. How, you know, what the, what, what's in this tune. And then when you get there, stop. You always have another song. And you can always get better. That's the other thing is you will get better. That's the other thing I can tell you as a, an artist is that your stuff that you release now will be worse than the stuff that you release five years from now won't be like horrible, but it'll be different, right? It may not, let's say not worse, it'll be different. And that's okay, that's totally cool. Like you just gotta, you gotta do it. I mean, it's like my friend Tom back there who's, who's sitting in the back, he tells me, I've been trying, I've been, I've been flirting with putting this information on the internet for like five years. And I don't wanna do it because I'm scared. I have a face for radio. Right, and it's like, I don't know if I can handle this, and I don't know if I can handle the comment section, right? Oh my God, like what if they say I'm, I'm an idiot? Because I mean, I know I am to some extent, but it's just like, I get scared, but you have to just be like, well, whatever, you put it out there and then you just get better, and it is what it is, and yeah, it's the internet and it's there forever, but then people can see your growth. There you go. So that would be my thing, is if you're gonna do it by yourself, 
Time is your friend. Build in spaces to work. Work on a different tune. You know, you have one tune, work on a different tune, and always put space between the songs. But then everything else stays the same. You still have to practice. You still have to really understand your music. You have to understand your influences and where you're going with it. I think that's what makes self-produced people so uh, good, the good ones, is they know exactly what they want, and then they just do that. And that's really what you, how you want it. But I would also employ, like employ a boyfriend, employ a girlfriend, employ uh, a mentor, anybody. Shit, you can send me one of your tracks and I have no problem listening to it and giving you my, my thoughts on it, right? Just, just take advantage of other people to just to get sort of, and, and don't like take it as gospel. Don't be like, oh, well, this person said, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is, but I like it. If you like it, then do it. Right? It doesn't matter, but just, you know, you can go, oh, that might be a good idea. Like I had a, an artist who at the end of one of their songs wanted to play the Star Spangled Banner because it was part of like the, the kitschiness of the song and they were making some kind of statement or whatever. Okay. And the song was like, da -na 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 -na, and he went, da, 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 da. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not the beat that the Star Spangled Banner starts on. No, it needs to go like da na 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 na, da na da da, because that's how it goes. And he would not change it at all. And of course, he didn't want to play with a click track, so the poor guitarist didn't even know when to come in, because because there were no click tracks. So he's like trying to do it, and he keeps missing it by like an eighth note, and all of this stuff. And it was just it was incredibly frustrating. But in the end, when they finally released the song. It was on the offbeat because that's where the Star Spangled Banner goes. If you're going to do it, do it right because it then clicks in people's head and go, oh, that's the Star Spangled Banner, right? Like it, that's, it's part of the kitsch. It's part of the push. So being able to sort of accept those ideas as opposed to just like crushing them immediately is important as an artist when you have a vision because sometimes people can be like okay your vision is great just shift it an eighth note and it's perfect kind of thing more questions does that, oh, does that does that answer your question yeah. great anybody else anything ask me anything you've got two minutes yes how do you push somebody that says i like everything but country Help me. Like, like, help me make a sound. I, okay, so she asked, if they like everything but country, help me, I'm trying to find a sound. Okay, well, see, the thing is, is, yeah, they may like everything but country, but there is no way, no way. Well, number one, I would make them listen to country. Seriously, uh, I had a, uh, so my professor was uh, at, at, at my undergrad, he made us listen to everything. And one day he came in and he made us listen to Zydeco music. And I remember literally telling him, because I hated it, even though it's actually really cool now, I don't know why I hated it back then, but I, I, apparently I didn't like it. And I told him, why the hell would I ever listen to this? There's no way I'm ever gonna be involved in Zydeco music. And he went, you never know. You better know, you never know. And not, Six months later did I graduate, end up at the, for my master's degree at the University of Louisiana Lafayette where I had to document Zydeco music. I mean, literally, I sat there and was just like, I can't believe he was right, it doesn't make, so first thing is I would make them listen because, you know, you never know. Maybe they don't like country because country is, has a stigma and they've never listened to it, right? Or it could be that they actually detest it, but there may be something that they, like you can learn so much from what you, about what you like from what you don't like. So if they like everything, then just find out what they don't like. Okay, you don't like country music, what don't you like? You don't like talking about trucks and girls and dogs and stuff, fine, then we will write a song about something else, right? But I would, I would, I would then look at the things they don't like and figure out where their sound is that way. Because that's, that's, you know, that would be the smallest, that would be the path to least resistance. Anything else? 
All right, one last thing before I let you go, because we're over by a minute. I want to hear from you. I'm being pushy now. I started out being less pushy in my first panel, and now I am being super pushy. I want to hear from you all. I want to know what you guys and gals would love to hear me talk about and teach at MAGFest next year. Um, I can talk and teach about anything. If you want to learn about how to make better podcasts, I can do that. I'm an audio professional, and I pretty much can do everything. Um, the only thing I can't, and, and if you ask me to do something, like how do I get better stuff on Twitch, I will figure it out. I'll just get Twitch and figure it out. Like I can do that. Um, but I also want to know like what I can, you know, what you guys would like to see on the internet and what would be helpful and how can I feed into this DIY sense. But so you, you know, doing, you, doing it yourself doesn't mean you have to do it alone. And so, you know, I'd love to help and give you my knowledge. Okay, so please contact me, either Twitter, that's a Twitter QR code apparently, um, or email me or whatever, and I'd be happy, happy, happy to, uh, to release some content. I did see one hand back there. Yeah, I think so. Oh, half-baked idea, well, yeah, absolutely. Come on up. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming at 11 o'clock on a Sunday. I am thrilled that you were all here. Thank you very much.